<laughs> My name is Ann Wyrapo. This is March 6th, 2018, and I am at the Utah Valley University George Sutherland Archives in Orem, Utah, interviewing Janice Lindley for the purposes of the Utah Women's Walk. Today, we are going to be talking about Janice's life and her contributions to the state of Utah. Janice, my first question today is really about background information. Can you tell us where and when you were born? Yes, I was born June 7th, 1964 at the Logan LDS Hospital, which has since been destroyed and is now a parking lot, a kitty corner to where the Logan LDS Temple is. Very good. Uh, can you tell me about your family life, your parents, your siblings, the birth order, and something that you'd like me to know about that? Sure. My father is William Franklin Farnsworth. He was born and raised in southern Utah in Beaver, Utah. And my mother is Rhonda Furman Farnsworth. She was born and raised in Providence, Utah, in Cache Valley. I have uh, three older brothers and four sisters. Uh, the birth order, my brother LaVon Farnsworth. Uh, he goes by Vaughn. And David and Dan and then Dina and then myself and then my younger sisters, Rhonda Lee, Annette, and Maria. Tell us about where you attended school. I attended uh, school to begin with at River Heights Elementary, and then our family moved to La Paz, Bolivia, where I attended the Calvert American Cooperative School in Calacoto, La Paz, Bolivia, first through fourth grade. Then I returned to River Heights Elementary for fifth and sixth grade, and then I attended South Cache Junior High, and then Skyview High School, and then I attended Utah State University where I was a cheerleader my freshman year at Utah State. Go Aggies! <laughs> <laughs> and then I, um, I did take one quarter up at Ricks College, and then I, um, then after my mission and after I was married, I attended one quarter at University of Utah. And um, seven years ago, eight years ago, I have returned to finish my studies at University of Utah. And I did take five credits of Chinese at UVU that were transferred to the U, and I'll be graduating from the University of Utah in Human Development and Family Studies the first weekend of May 2018. Yay! I'm so excited. <laughs> so wonderful. It's been a long journey, but I've enjoyed my school experiences. What were the important memories that you have from your childhood? Most of my memories revolve around um, my family and living in a foreign country in La Paz, Bolivia and traveling to other um, countries in South and Central America as well as the Eastern United States on our way home from living in Bolivia. Um, other memories that I have of my childhood include growing up in River Heights and um, our family had a corn patch. My father decided that if we were going to be skiing, and skiing was an expensive sport for a family with eight children, that we needed to earn some money do, uh, so that we could enjoy the activities such as skiing, snow skiing. So we, in addition to having a corn patch and um, growing, uh, cultivating, weeding, watering, <laughs> irrigating, <laughs> picking um, corn and then selling it, we uh, also, my siblings and I, we always had a paper out that we did. And so that enabled us to participate in some of those sports that we like to do, such as snow skiing at Beaver Mountain up Logan Canyon. Yeah. So those memories of childhood, um, also one of the important memories that I have are horses. Um, my brothers, they, had horses and as a young child, a young girl, I, as soon as they pulled up to the house and their horses, I bolted out the door and begged for a ride. 
And after our family returned from living in Bolivia in South America in 1974, when I was 10 years old, I uh, begged my parents for a horse of my own. And I was able to um, have a horse and participate in Horse 4-H. And my horse had been trained, my horse's name was Chica. And my horse was a um, uh, black and white paint horse that had been trained in barrel racing. And so I held on for dear life and we always got a blue ribbon. <laughs> so that was my experiences growing up and, and really just fond memories of, of family togetherness. Um, we went camping together. We, um, we worked together. We played together. Um, we went to church together. We, we, I come from a very close family. So that's, those are my childhood memories that I treasure most. What a beautiful childhood. Yeah. Can you spell the city that you were in, in Bolivia? I know you're to La Paz, but there was... Calacoto. Yes. Uh -huh. Calacoto. Yeah, it's C-A-L-A-C-O-T-O. -A -A Calacoto. What years were you there from? We were there in 1970 to 1974. Okay. So I was age 6 through age 10. While yeah. we're doing dates, Janice, what date were you born? What year I was born that? June 7, 1964. Yes. Is there one experience from your early beginnings that you think prepared you for your life work? I would say living in South America because it enabled me to see the world outside of Cache Valley, Utah. And um, as we traveled throughout South and Central America and as I um, rubbed shoulders with people of different nations and of different religious belief, different cultures, different ethnicity, I came to appreciate and love people of all walks of life. And so I, um, I think that that had a, a deep impact on the person that I am today. And as I witnessed my father serving the people of South America in various ways, and my brothers with their Eagle projects, you know, building desks and chairs for, for poor schools up on the Altiplano, I realized that um, we have a responsibility because we've been given, been given much, you know, we need to serve those that are less fortunate than us. Yet, I also discovered that even though they may have been uh, poor in terms of financial and material wealth and blessings, they, they taught me a lesson in that you, didn't, you don't need to have money to be happy. and um, I was amazed and, and um, inspired and motivated by these wonderful people in South and Central America. I also served a mission in Peru, in Arequipa, Peru, Tacna, and Puno, and um, with, very, with people that had very limited uh, resources, financial and material resources, and yet I, I witnessed how happy they were and so I, they taught me, they taught me a lot, and I and I appreciate those lessons that I was able to experience firsthand as a young child, and how that enabled me to see the world outside of my family and outside of of Utah. Yeah. You mentioned that your father did some things to help the people mm -hmm. there. Can you explain more about why your whole family was moving to Bolivia? Yes, my father, he, um, he, he, was, uh, he worked at Utah State University in agriculture extension. And um, USAID, along with the extension service, worked with the extension service in Bolivia to enhance and help the Bolivians with their natural resources. Um, he was there to work with Bolivian agriculture administrators to help them with their um, 
irrigation techniques, to improve their irrigation techniques, or to improve the way that they, um, the yield on the, the wool of the sheep. Um, different things that have to do with livestock and agriculture is what this group of extension service men did. Um, does that answer the question? It does. As a child, do you remember being happy or sad to do this type of a life change that you were all going to move to Bolivia? You must have been proud of your father and of his work, but you also had to leave things behind. So tell us more about how you felt. Okay. Um, it's interesting because my mother tells the story about my sister, just older than I am, Dina. And we were at, we were having our passport pictures taken. And the lady taking the pictures said, oh, well, this is wonderful that your family has this opportunity to have this experience. And you will love living in this other place. And my older sister turned to my mom and said, mom, where are we going? Because my parents didn't want to, to spread the word too quickly, too fast, prior to having everything in order. And so the children, we were the last to know <laughs> that we were moving out of the country. <laughs> and so I remember as a, a young six-year-old in first grade um, receiving the news that we would be moving far, far away. <laughs> And a couple things that concerned me as a six-year-old was leaving behind my best friend, Cami Weston, that lived across the street from me. So just as I think about it now, and it brings a few tears to my eyes, I'm sure that as a little six-year-old, I shed a few tears um, leaving my, my best friend, Cami Weston. My mom reassured me we could write letters while we were away, which we did. Um, it was interesting though, four years is a long time to be away from your best friend. And when I came back, four years later, I found a new best friend <laughs> who liked horses. <laughs> yeah. Who were the women that you admired while you were growing up? My mother and my grandmothers, first and foremost. Um, as a teenager, my young women leaders. These were the women that I wanted to be like. They're the women that um, cared for me, served me. Uh, they exemplified the type of womanhood that I wanted to grow into. And so I look to these mentors, my mother, my grandmothers, my aunts, my young women leaders, as the women that I most admired and that had the greatest influence for me as a woman. Tell us some of the things that you learned how to do from your, um, your important women. Like I know you, Janice, as somebody that can cook and can and take care of a large family. How did you learn how to do all those things? I learned how to do those things through observation and through participation. <laughs> working alongside my mother, my grandmothers. Um, you know, my, there's a picture that is in this little book and it's also framed in my mother's house of all of the girls and my grandmothers and my mother sitting around a quilt, um, you know, putting our stitches in for, for someone's trousseau, for my sister-in-law, my older sister-in-law, my brother, um, for their wedding. Um, we did a lot of quilting, we did a lot of canning, we did a lot of gardening um, together as a family. Um, and, and so those are some of the things I really appreciate what these mentors taught me. Um, some additional things is um, my mother and her education, for example. Um, my mother, she received her bachelor's degree in um, child development and home economics and elementary ed. And so she was able to teach elementary for a year 
prior to having her eight children. And she emphasized always the importance of education. And so, and she belonged to like literary clubs and she was always reading a book and either presenting that book or uh, listening, to, listening to another uh, person in her literary club present a book. In fact, she's 88 years old and she is still belongs to probably 10 or so uh, clubs or groups and she's presenting a book this coming week that is entitled Romances of the Prophets or something to that effect. And so she practiced that with us last week when we were at her house. She shared um, her report. It was going to be an hour long report on her book that she had read for her literary club. So um, she's a great, amazing woman that I admire and love and respect so much. Did you have one particular person that influenced you or mentored you that you feel uh, really influenced you the most? Yeah, that would be my mother, okay. yes. Um, I would guess it would be good for us to maybe talk about her father as well at this point. Can you tell us a little bit about your father's influence too? My father and my mother were always united in everything. So if I talk about my mother and her influence, I'm often talking about also my father and his influence. They worked so well as a married couple and as a team raising their family. My father, of course, he worked hard and provided for our family and um, he had high expectations of his children. and he wanted us to be diligent students and he wanted us to do our best and he wanted us to work hard and he wanted us to um, his mother had passed down to him the motto be honest and true in all that you do and so that's something that we children often time, times heard from our father he he wanted us to be always uh, something he learned from his mother was to always be busy and never be idle. So my, the joke was that my grandmother, while you were sitting down, she would say, while you're sitting there, why don't you peel some potatoes <laughs> while you're resting <laughs> or something to that effect. So, um, so there was, my father, he he definitely taught me and my and my siblings to be busy and one of his favorite scriptures was to be anxiously engaged in a good cause um and also um he he did he taught us the gospel and he was a a great priesthood um presider of our home he gave us blessings you know before we would start school and he taught us the gospel around the kitchen table. Um, his sister was instrumental in writing, helping to write the book, the Gospel Principles book. So on Sunday afternoons, we would ha read a chapter of that together as a family and discuss that around the, the table. And he would share past experiences from a cousin or a relative or a friend from Beaver who had a word of wisdom challenge and how he died premature because of alcoholism or something to that effect. And so from that, those teachings at an early age, as I grew up and was a teenager and in college, I had already made decisions and choices to protect my health by, you know, not partaking of addictive substances or substances that could, you know, destroy my health and, and well-being. So he, he had a huge influence, I think, in, in, in teaching the gospel in our home and having family home evening and scripture study and family prayer. So that was how I think he had the greatest influences on me. Yeah. That's remarkable. You talked a little bit about 
you know, your teenage years, and um, we know that you became a cheerleader at Utah State University. That's a big thing. But tell us a little bit more about what you really enjoyed doing in those years and uh, how that influenced your life. Um, okay, are we on to the, let me see. Yeah, that's number eight. Okay. Oh, is it your question or the other question? We're almost to my question. Oh, 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 so okay. Um, oh, what did I enjoy doing as a teenager <coughs> and young adult years? Um, horseback riding. I also loved um, jumping on our trampoline and doing tumbling and cheerleading. And that transferred into um, actually doing diving my senior year of high school. The um, swim coach, he knew that I loved doing tumbling and gymnastics. And so he, he begged me for two years to be on his diving team because as a swim team, you get points from divers as well. So he wanted to enhance, he had a really good swim team and he knew that if he could get some good divers that they could go to state, which we did, we went to state. And um, so my senior year, I, I overcame some fears about diving into water <laughs> because I could tumble on the ground or I could tumble on a trampoline, but going into water was a fear I had in terms of jumping and doing flips and then landing in the water either, you know, in a diving position, either head, you know, with head first or feet first. So I did learn the five basic dives, a front dive, a back dive, a, a twist dive, and a inward dive and a reverse dive. And then I learned five additional optional dives based off of those five basic dives. So I would do a double front, a double back, a one and a half with a full twist, um, an inward one and a half. Uh, and um, anyway, so I actually came in second in region. And then I went to state where I took 16th place at state. <laughs> but hey, I went to state. And I lettered. So that was pretty fun. Amazing. So. And she can still out jump and out do everybody. Oh, yes, it's college. true. I can out beat my own children who did gymnastics as well and tumbling in um, add ons. Add ons is a game that you play on the trampoline. And I do a back and a half with a full twist on the trampoline, and it's fun. What a remarkable person. Yeah, but I also like snow skiing and water skiing and horseback riding, and um, those are some of the things, and camping and, and doing those things with family and friends um, were really fun as I was growing up. So you're quite an active. outdoorsman in many ways. And very, active. Yes, yeah. very active. You play tennis with Paige Holland, I know, yes. to be with her as well. Isn't yes. there a group of you that go up and uh -huh. do Sundance and yes. the other yeah. resorts? Yeah, we do a lot of snow skiing together with the ladies and playing tennis. And tennis was something that I had a summer tennis clinic or class I would go to on occasion. But as a youth and as a teenager, I felt it was a little bit too slow of a sport, but now that I'm 53, I love tennis, and it's just my speed right now. Plus, when we took the young woman from the Women of UVU Club to Janice's house, she had built on the hill her own slip and slide. And she <laughs> yeah. was the first one to put on her suit and go down with these young yeah. women um, yeah. with, with some soap, right? Yeah. Soap and so you slip and you yeah. slide. Yeah. So you, yeah, that you was really fun. Remarkably uh, outgoing. Yeah just love to be energetic and fun. Yeah, I love to be active. I think that that's the funnest way to exercise. I agree. Yeah. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, your time in Bolivia and you also served a mission. Uh, I, I want to go through, could you please list the countries that you've lived yes. outside of the U.S. and why you were there? and then how these opportunities broadened your perspective and increased your desire to improve things globally, maybe, you know, the humanitarianism 
of seeing people in different situations than maybe what you were used to. Okay, yes. And I did uh, spend some time typing this, these answers out, so if you're okay, I'm going to read them. Okay. So I learned some valuable lessons living overseas through my experiences living in Bolivia, Peru, Hong Kong, Japan, China, and Australia, as well as opportunities to visit many other countries on holiday or humanitarian trips. I've learned that all mankind everywhere share a lot more in common with who they are and what they do than the differences we may perceive because of religion, ethnicity, race, culture, socioeconomic status, etc. We are brothers and sisters of this world in this, on this mortal journey together, and as we come to appreciate each other's strengths and differences, we can meet some of the common basic needs of food, shelter, clean drinking water, education, and share in the feeling of safe, being safe, connected, and competent. We need each other. I've come to love and appreciate people of all walks of life. That's so important, and you live that way. Uh, if we could discuss for a minute your love of mankind and of humanitarian work, how do you and your dear husband, Corey, the founding executive, president, and chief financial officer of doTERRA International, implement the sacred responsibility to share the blessings of success that you have been given? I think the love I have of mankind and the humanitarian work I've been involved in throughout my life could be traced back to being raised in a family with parents and siblings, being proactive in helping and serving others throughout the world. Thanksgiving always included having some university students from South America, Africa, or the Middle East joining in with us. In Bolivia, my brothers were involved in such activities as making desks and chairs for schools with little resources on the Altiplano. Doing humanitarian work has been a part of me since as long as I can remember and has continued on with my husband and with myself and our family. We really enjoy serving and helping others as it brings us great feelings of accomplishing something meaningful for someone else. When we bring happiness to others through our service and humanitarian projects, it makes us happy. In China, we enjoy taking our children with us on a boat to a distant village across a thousand lakes is what it's called, for the dedication of a new school New Skin had built. Our children mingled with the Chinese children and we sponsored eight Chinese children's schooling for primary through their high school education. As I reflect on the numerous meaningful humanitarian efforts we've been involved in, too numerous to mention, but I'm happy to mention more, <laughs> um, my heart rejoices for those that we've been able to serve. I learned that while you can't do everything for everyone, you can do something for someone. Janice, could you describe your love of horses, the great outdoors, and the gospel of Jesus Christ? How do they fuel your endless positivity and ability to lift others? Um, wait, where's the... It's number 11. Wait, which one? Number 11. I, I changed the number. Oh, did you? I'm so sorry. Oh, may not have sorry. That. Is that the Wait, are you saying describe your love of horses? Yes, that one. Okay. Describe your love of horses. That one? Can you reread the question or can you just cut Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Say okay. Describe your love of horses, the great outdoors, and the gospel of Jesus Christ. How do you feel they fuel your endless positivity and ability to lift others. Okay. When I was a little girl, my three older brothers had horses. As they would approach the house on their horses, I would bolt out of the door and beg to have them give me a ride. I've always loved how horses smell, their soft mane and coat, and have always enjoyed stroking a horse. There's a sense of peace and contentment I receive when I'm around horses and especially when I have an opportunity to ride them. I especially love trail riding in the mountains with friends and family. I think I inherited this love of horses from my brothers and my father who grew up riding horses, who my father who grew up riding horses in the Beaver Mountains in southern Utah. I think it's important to find what rejuvenates us so that we can have that positive energy to fulfill our responsibilities and pursuits. I currently have three horses, Blue, a Mustang, Cooper, a Quarter Horse, and Pockets, a Foxtrotter. 
And as I mentioned prior, I had a horse named Chica, a black and white paint, when I was 11 through 13 years old and was involved in Horse 4-H and was a barrel racing blue ribbon champion. <laughs> if I humbly say so myself. Okay, <laughs> the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, you also asked about how the gospel of Jesus Christ um, fuels my endless positivity and ability to lift others. Okay, the gospel of Jesus Christ and my membership in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has always been a very in inter integral, integral, <laughs> integral, has always been a very integral part of my endless positivity and ability to lift others. From birth, I was surrounded with with exemplary parents that demonstrated optimism and enthusiasm for life by striving to live the gospel of Jesus Christ in their personal lives and in our family, within our family, and then influencing and helping others for good. I learned that the gospel of Jesus Christ is for all mankind and that it brings hope and healing into the lives of those that, into the lives of those we associate with and love. The atonement of Jesus Christ to me is at the heart of it all. And I just taught a lesson on this last Sunday to the young women about the atonement of Jesus Christ. And I like this and how we can apply it to us. As we come to understand the atonement and its power in our lives, we gain strength to overcome sin and adversity through the Savior's grace. We will find peace and healing. Our love for and commitment to the Savior will deepen and we will feel a greater desire to share our testimony of Him with others. I personally believe that this power of the atonement of Jesus Christ in our lives sets us on a course of striving to love and serve others and to have an optimistic attitude about life and concern for others. I always want to be found striving to be a faithful ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ in the things that I think, say, and do. I don't know if that's too scripted, <laughs> but... I think it's beautiful. I think it really captured you know, but you can the ask essence me. of your testimony, though. Okay. And I feel like um, Janice just typifies. Janice is such an example to other people, but she humanizes everything. It, she's not preachy. She's how do we make things better from where we are and always be respectful of the Savior and what he's given us. So I love your examples, and I think that looks oh, thank you. exactly like what you needed to share. Um, thank you. And I, I'll just say that... I've always known you as a very righteous person mm -hmm. and a good example, and a good example to me, and it's somebody that I would like to pattern my life after, and the way that you've raised your children. We should talk for just a second about them serving missions. Many yeah. of them have gone all over I, the world. I don't think that my husband and I and our children would have the strong family that we have today without the gospel of Jesus Christ in our lives and applying the principles and the gospel teachings that we strive to do. Because with living overseas, for example, in China, um, many families end up being divided and split up and husbands become unfaithful to their wives because the Chinese women are very forward <laughs> in China at times on men on business trips etc but my husband is a branch president there in China one of the unique things that we actually had while living in China was we had church at our house for two years we had hundred and fifty people every Sunday for three hours and my husband was the branch president and every room in our house was used for a classroom or <laughs> uh, something like that. So we, um, that was a really interesting experience, you know, living in China, communist China. <laughs> and um, we grew to love living in China and the Chinese people and the Chinese culture. And um, we found that we could still practice our faith and religion while living there in China and the Chinese government, the religious authorities from the Chinese government, they were aware of our, uh, what was happening. They were aware that church was being held at our house with um, foreign members of, that were living in China. Um, we, um, yeah, I, it was, I mean, there's so much I wish that I could you know, communicate to you about that experience that we had that was just precious. Um, and which reminded me also, while we were in Bolivia, the young ambassadors from 
the singing group from BYU, came to visit at the time that we were living in Bolivia. When we were living in, and they, we had members of the Young Ambassadors come to our home for dinner and we went to the program in La Paz. Then when we were living in China, the Young Ambassadors came to China, to Shanghai, and we hosted them in our house for dinner and for a fireside, and which was also where we met for church <laughs> in our big house there in China. Then when we were in Australia, and my husband was serving as a mission president there, again, the Young Ambassadors came and we fed them in Australia. So it was really a neat experience that we had. The Young Ambassadors really do a remarkable job spreading goodwill throughout the world through their music and song and verse, you know, so. Um, I think you did a lot to spread goodwill yourself <laughs> and to always host these things. That's but, remarkable. But for our children, it was really fun because two of our children were baptized in China. And um, one was baptized in the swimming pool in our home. The other one was baptized in the swimming pool in the um, complex where we lived. And um, yeah, yeah, it was really amazing. It was really neat. We had, as I mentioned, 160 people in our branch. We had 80 children in the primary. And so after we had sacrament meeting in our big gathering area, that's where they would hold sharing time and singing time. And um, our little boy, Brady, who was probably how old was he at that time? Six, seven, eight. He and his buddies would oftentimes hide in the pantry and eat potato chips during <laughs> church. And we knew right where to find them. <laughs> and then another fun thing about that is we have a tradition in our family of having a Sunday dinner with a roast, a pot roast and mashed potatoes and vegetables and homemade rolls. And so it was always a challenge during fast and testimony meeting and Sunday when we could all smell the roast cooking in the, in the oven because after church and everyone would leave, then our family would have family dinner and oftentimes we'd invite someone to join us for our Sunday family dinner. And with our children, we always divided up the, our Sunday dinner um, food items. So our boy, our oldest boy, he knew how to make jello and he it was his job to always have jello. And other children knew how to make the gravy or to make biscuits or rolls and that was really fun or to make the dessert. Um, fun experiences. We also had early morning seminary there and I was a seminary the seminary teacher for nine students before school. So we got up really early and we had our family scripture study and family prayer and family breakfast before early morning seminary and then the kids went off to school and they would travel by bus by well they would travel our our driver <laughs> in our van would take them to school or they could catch the school bus and it was usually an hour for them on the bus to um, school but it was a good experience for me as a mother to live overseas and have that experience along with the experience of living overseas as a child in Bolivia and, and to see the difference between being a child and a parent. But I came to appreciate every place where we lived and really uh, grew to love the people and the culture um, and the language of where we lived in those countries. Thank you for that. I think that's profound. Oh. And I think your children have also been blessed to feel like you do. They've gone on foreign missions, many of them, and mm -hmm. lived quite international lives. That, yes. You know, it's continued generation after generation. Has yes, been. yeah. Our daughter right now with her husband and three children live in Luxembourg, which is a small country between France and Germany. And so they're enjoying that experience over there right now. I, ha I must include that I did give birth to our fourth child in Tokyo, Japan. And that was a wonderful, interesting experience in and of itself. And um, a little Japanese nun nurse midwife at an international Catholic hospital in Shinjuku, just outside of Tokyo, is the one that, uh, that delivered Devon 
our first son after three daughters. And uh, that was a, a beautiful experience to give birth to him there. Although the epidural did not work as it should, it numbed my left knee only. But that's probably too much information. <laughs> Janice, you told us that your oldest daughter is in Luxembourg now. No, our actually oh, our okay, third daughter, one. third daughter, yes. one of our. I, I think I mentioned one of our daughters, right? Okay, <laughs> Janice, can you tell me about your children and um, maybe name them and when sure. they were born and maybe what they're doing now? Okay, yeah, um, we have six daughters and two sons. Uh, we have three daughters, and then a son, and then a daughter, and then a son, and then two daughters. That's the, the order of female, male. Um, our oldest daughter, Erica, she is married and has uh, three children. She's married to Coleman Green, and they live in, in Texas, in Dallas, Texas, Grapevine, Texas, actually. And they have three children, as I mentioned. And Erica and Coleman, they met their senior year of high school at Shanghai American School and in their math class. And they instantly became best friends and they started to date. And he um, was not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. His grandfather was a retired Presbyterian minister from Kansas. And um, so Coleman, however, recognized something special in our daughter Erica and in her faith as well. And he had a desire to read the Book of Mormon his senior year, and he wanted to be baptized, and his parents wanted him to wait until he, um, they wanted to make sure that he was doing this for himself and not because he really liked our daughter Erica. So he went to school after he graduated from after they graduated from Shanghai American School, Erica went to BYU and studied social work, and Coleman went to University of Rochester and studied engineering. And um, a year after his freshman year, his parents consented to support him in his baptism, and he was baptized in Utah during the summer of 2000, 2007. And he served a mission in the Tacoma, Washington, Spanish-speaking mission a year later, and Erica graduated from BYU in three years and then went to uh, Taiwan, the Taichung Kaohsiung mission. She was a fabulous missionary. After their missions, um, Coleman flew back when Erica arrived, and she was released as a full-time missionary, and he took her to the Mount Timpanogos Temple, and he knelt down on one knee and proposed to her, and they were married five years after they first met in their math class. And they are, he works with Abbott Laboratories in Dallas um, and is a, a medical engineer and doing a great job there. They love living in Texas. Our second daughter, Robin, is married to Chris Shelton. And Robin and Chris have four children. Uh, our first grandson, Colin Christopher Shelton, he passed away. It will be eight years this August. Uh, and he, um, he was born premature. He, was, he lived for three days. And um, they are doing well now, raising their three living children that are quite a handful, as all little children are, <laughs> keeping them busy. And he just graduated from Wharton Business School back in Pennsylvania. And he works in um, Draper. And the name of his business has just left me right now. <laughs> but he um, he's very successful in what he does. I should probably, I can add what he does later, right? Okay, our third daughter, Megan, she married uh, Matt Jensen. And Matt Jensen was one of our missionaries from 
wait, can I go back to Robin? <laughs> Sorry, okay. Let me go back to Robin, because I, I have to say that um, Robin, she met her husband her freshman year at BYU. And when we moved to Australia, we left our freshman daughter, Robin, and a sophomore daughter, Erica, at BYU and moved to Australia. The first time that our family had moved overseas without us all being together. So it took a lot of faith to leave two young single adult girls in Utah while we moved halfway across the world. Um, during Robin's freshman year at BYU, she met Chris in the accounting lab. And Chris, his mother's name is also Robin. He fell in love with our daughter and our daughter fell in love with Chris. And Chris was teaching missionaries at the MTC that were coming to our mission. So we had that connection with Chris. And then I mentioned to my daughters, if any of them were to get married during the three years that we were in Australia, the requirement was that they come to Australia to be married in the Melbourne Temple, which was a mile away from the mission home. So Chris and his family traveled over to Australia and they were married in the Melbourne Australia Temple one year after we got there. So that was special. Then our third daughter, Megan, Megan Jensen, she and Matt, uh, they currently live in Luxembourg and he works with doTERRA. And he got his, um, his Master's of Accountancy at BYU. But he was, we first met Matt in the mission field. He was one of our missionaries. And Megan, at the time, was in high school and did not have really much interaction with the missionaries. And so she, after a year and a half, graduated from high school in Australia and then moved back to Utah to attend BYU with her sisters. Matt was with us for two years. After his mission, he returned to Utah and he started to date our daughter and then they got married when we got home from our mission. And they have three children. So our son-in-law is one of the best things that we have, <laughs> that we now have three beautiful grandchildren as well from that experience in Australia with my husband being a mission president. Um, take a drink. Both Robin and Megan also graduated from BYU. Robin graduated in the accounting program. She's a smart girl, really does, does really well with math. And uh, Megan graduated from BYU. They all three oldest daughters graduated in three years from BYU. I think they're schooling in at Shanghai American School in Shanghai that cost new skin $20,000 per year per student, um, was a very exceptionally great private school, which helped them excel when they went to college at BYU. They were able to do that without a problem transition from high school to college. Um, but Megan graduated in marketing. Um, all three of my oldest daughters are stay-at-home moms raising their children right now and, and dedicating their life to their children and to their husband and to their family. Um, they also serve in their community and in, and in their church and in church. Um, Megan and Matt are enjoying their experience living in Luxembourg, where the language is Luxembourgish and French. And so our little grandson goes to a little preschool where he learns how to speak French. So that's neat that they have that experience. And they're able to travel all over Europe. And we have visited them there. We enjoy traveling and visiting our family wherever they are. Um, our fourth child, our first son that was born in Tokyo, Japan, Devon. He, um, Devon Corey Lindley, he has his father's middle name. He graduated in December from BYU in the accounting department and he uh, will, he has a job lined up this summer. He starts his job, his real job in life uh, in San Francisco with a um, company called Lazard in San Francisco, which is a boutique investment banking company. So he's uh, looking forward to that experience. And then we have our daughter, our fourth daughter, 
fifth child, Haley Lindley. She is married to James Christiansen. They live in Michigan, and he works with Whirlpool in supply chain. He graduated from BYU in supply chain, and Haley's graduated from BYU in psychology. And uh, she and James welcomed triplets into their family one year after they were born. I mean, after they were married. One year after Haley and James were married, they uh, had triplets join their family. And my grandmother was a twin. My mother's mom was a twin. And there were two sets of twins in my, my grandmother's family. And then my aunt, my grandmother's daughter, my mom's sister, she also had twins. So fertility runs in our family as well as multiples. <laughs> and so our triplet grandchildren in Michigan Two girls that are identical, Tilly and Elsie, and then a little boy, Parley, are just beautiful. And they, uh, they were born at 33 weeks in Michigan. They're now six months old, and they're thriving. They're 15 pounds plus, and just right on track with other children that are, you know, their age. So it's really a blessing, and they're enjoying life. Okay, after Haley, we have Brady, our son Brady. He just returned home from his mission. Oh, I forgot to tell you where all the, the all serve missions. <gasps> okay, um, let me just say, Erica served a mission in Taiwan, Coleman in Washington, um, Chris in Washington, the state of Washington. Uh, Robin did not serve a mission. Meg, she got married, Megan got married, Matt served in Australia, and Devin served in, in Taiwan, Taipei mission. Haley served in Cambodia, James served in Russia, and Brady served his mission in Thailand. And Brady is a student at UVU, enjoying being a student at UVU. And he is 20 years old, and he is hoping he's going, going to go to California and sell security systems this summer, <laughs> hoping to be make it rich, I guess. Um, and then after Brady, we have Kelsey and Alyssa, our two teenage daughters that are still living at home with us. And they attend Mountain View High School, and they're involved in cross country and track and basketball and soccer. And um, so my husband and I were not fully retired yet <laughs> from raising our family. But yes, we have uh, 13 grandchildren with another on the way. Our oldest daughter is expecting another baby in August. So that will make 14 grandchildren, and we have eight children. <laughs> you spoke about education and how important it's been in your children's life, but I'd like you to talk about education in your life. Okay. What inspired you to finish your bachelor's degree later in life, and how have you shouldered the burden of difficult classes such as studies of domestic violence prevention, the Chinese language, and so forth? Does it feel great to be such a good example to your children, your neighbors, and all around you? Okay. I was inspired to finish my bachelor's degree later in life by a talk I heard by President Gordon B. Hinckley promoting education for women with the concept of being a lifelong learner which he exemplified himself. I never had a desire in my life to be a career woman. Um, both my parents were also a great influence on me, completing, um, both of my parents were also a huge influence on me in completing my bachelor's degree. My mother graduated from USU in early childhood education, home economics, and elementary education, and used her skills teaching school for a year prior to being a stay-at-home mom a stay-at-home mother, homemaker, raising eight kids. My father received his bachelor's degree from BYU in agriculture, his master's from USU in general agriculture, and his doctorate from University of Wisconsin in agriculture extension. Their example and influence and love of learning and becoming educated has been my greatest motivator. I'm also eternally grateful for the supportive husband and children who have made my journey of finishing my degree a possibility. 
I could never have accomplished this goal without their support. I've enjoyed all of my university classes as an older returning student in the field of human development and family st studies. I've taken one class every semester for the past eight years. Some of my classes have been very challenging like math 1030, statistics, family violence, and I even took five credits of Chinese from UVU that transferred to the University of Utah where I'll graduate this May 2018. I've been able to shoulder the burden of difficult classes through the support and help of my family. It helped, it helped to talk with my husband and family about difficult subjects such as domestic violence and what we can do to help others that are suffering from these things. In regard to learning Chinese, it helps to have a son and daughter review my Chinese homework since they both serve missions for the church in Taiwan. My children have been invaluable resources helping me with the technical things associated with the use of a computer, with in-class and online classes. They've read through my papers, proofread my papers, and offered suggestions. They've helped me with the proper use of APA formatting, etc. So, it feels wonderful to be accomplishing this goal of finishing my bachelor's degree. If I'm an example to others, that makes me happy too. One is never too old to set a goal and accomplish it, such as returning to school as an older student to complete a degree. I certainly have gained much from my education and feel more empowered to better serve in my home, church, community, and throughout the world. My confidence in myself has increased as I've realized I can accomplish hard things. Let's talk about um, receiving the Rainmaker Award, which you received from your surrounding community members, and it was a major accomplishment. How did it make you feel to have friends and family present and acknowledge your lifetime achievement? Your beloved father knew of your award before his passing, and he contributed to you being the kind of daughter that everyone would be so proud of. Can you share with us what you know about um, his feelings and about the community and everybody that helped you with the Rainmaker Award. Receiving the Rainmaker Award was such a wonderful surprise and gift and blessing. UVU Women's Success Center does nothing second rate. And the time and effort they put into making it a special day for me and a special award was amazing. Surrounded by people, friends, family, colleagues who I, whom I admire and love with all my heart, their present was something I will forever tre treasure. I remember feeling that every person should have a moment like this in their lives when others come together to express love and gratitude towards them. Receiving the Rainmaker Award was truly an unexpected gift, and I will forever be grateful. Thank you, Anne. <laughs> you had a huge part in that, I know. My father knew about the Rainmaker Award I, I was to receive and was looking forward to being there. However, he passed away on February 25th, 2017, just prior to the event. I know he was there in spirit and love and appreciate him for his thoughtfulness in telling me prior to his passing how proud he was of me for receiving this award and how he wished he could be there. Wow. My father's last advice to our family and to me was carry on. So beautiful. If you are comfortable sharing, what do you feel has been your most significant trial in your life? And what have you done to overcome it? <sighs> yeah, that's a, there's some hard Okay, where, what number are we on? Um, we'll be on second. Oh, I listed as 14, but I didn't think mine's right. Oh, yeah, 14. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, what? I, it's hard to just pinpoint like one significant trial or one significant challenge. I mean, I think we all, throughout our lives, we are faced with lots of different challenges. You know, I, I think it was challenging. Um, um, having eight children, having my eighth child. Um, I actually didn't have my eighth child in China, but she was made in China. <laughs> and then we returned for home leave a month early because of SARS, what was with SARS going on. And so, and also, 
I felt more confident delivering my eighth child at age 38 in the United States versus in China. So we came, we flew back one week before I delivered my eighth child. And um, we stayed in Utah for a couple months for like a summer leave of absence from China. And we went back and my husband had uh, a huge responsibility there in China with opening new markets and overseeing the Asia Pacific region for new skin. So we had been in Utah visiting family and it was time for him to go back to work and to travel. And I was there at home with a newborn in China and with our oldest daughter being 15, teenager on down to the newborn. So I remember that was a hard year. And every time my husband said, I need to go here <laughs> to travel on this business trip, the tears would stream. And um, because I, I needed and wanted him there with me um, all the time. <laughs> and um, it was that year that my, actually my father actually suffered a heart attack and we were living in China and he ended up being fine and recuperating and everything went well for that. But, but living far away from family and having a, a, new, a new baby and living in a foreign country and um, just facing all the responsibilities that that entails. I was, you know, also the primary president of, like I mentioned, 80 primary kids. And so we, at the new, beginning of every new year, you need to get new teachers called because new expat families are moving into the community. So you have to like reorganize the primary <laughs> pretty much. And then we have the primary program and then we have, we're in charge of the Halloween party or whatever, and then we have Christmas, and, and there were just a lot of things that were happening that I felt overwhelmed. And I even read Marie Osmond's book on, <laughs> on what, what is it, after you have a baby, post, postpartum depression, and realized that I, I didn't really feel like I had postpartum depression, but I felt like I was so stressed and at the end of my rope. I looked up online what nervous breakdown was because I wasn't sure <laughs> what a nervous breakdown was, but I felt like I was gonna have one. <laughs> but I was, I was able to manage the way that I was able to manage because I did feel a very overwhelmed at that time in my life. Um, I, of course, turned to the Lord, turned to my family and, um, through that experience, I was prompted and encouraged to look outside of myself and to find someone that needed some service, that needed help, someone that I could serve. And at that exact time, a new family was moving in with a mother that had just had a baby as well. And she was worried living in a foreign country. And she was worried about living in China and she wasn't she had never lived outside of the United States. And so as I reached out to help her, my burden was lifted. So to this day, I tell Tanya Brenchley that she saved me, but she says that I served, saved her. So we saved each other <laughs> that year. But I found that the more I served and looked out of myself, the more I served others, the, the less challenging my life was and the less hard my life was. And I found joy and peace and happiness as I reached out and served my family and served my friends and served others. So it was really the key if you're feeling like down or feeling, you know, like you can't go on, just look outside yourself and find someone you can serve because it will make you feel better. Uh, Janice, are there any words of wisdom or maxims that you have lived your life by? Well, I, I mentioned that my dad had always said, be honest and true in all that you do. That was just something that 
as a family, we have passed on to our children and to our grandchildren, and it came from my grandmother, who knows, but be honest and true in all that you do. That's something that we, we live by, that we strive to live by. Um, also, the motto, carry on, just as my father, you know, when he was passing away, he told us, you know, carry on. Um, also, um, I love, you know, that idea of being anxiously engaged in a good cause and doing much good, you know, doing whatever good you can. Um, um, any other words of wisdom or maxims? I also believe that, that about everybody should find something that they're passionate about and then give it your all because that there's just something invigorating about that. And so right now, I'm passionate about helping with this new suicide awareness and prevention um, thing that we have going on in the city of Orem and at Mountain View High School. And so that's bringing me a lot of joy to, to work on that project and to help improve um, what we have going on in Orem right now in terms of suicide awareness and prevention. My mother tragically lost her brother, my uncle, in his 80s just a few years ago to death by suicide. And 10 years prior to that, his son, my cousin, um, took his life. So um, it, I think that suicide is, a, because Utah has one of the highest suicide rates in the nation, I think it affects most everyone around, all of our neighbors and friends and family in Utah. And so it's something that needs to be addressed. And it's something that we need to improve what we're doing currently. And so. I'm very, very uh, anxiously engaged right now in, in this cause. And, and so I think everybody needs to find different things that they can be passionate about. And some of those things might be involved in someone's workplace where they work. For example, healing hands at doTERRA. You know, whatever we do in life, I think we need to find this passion within us and then really focus our efforts, our time, our energy, our efforts in accomplishing and fulfilling something too that addresses that whatever it may be, um, um, project or, or goal. And so I, I, I love, you know, that's something that, that I hope that I'm remembered for is that I, when I found something that meant something to me, I was passionate about it. And hopefully I can spread that, that energy and that, you know, that passion energy to other people to be passionate in things that, that will, to accomplish something in life to, that will bless and help others. So be passionate in doing something that will bless the lives of others. And in, and in the process, it's very fulfilling and, and very, um, very helpful for oneself. I don't know if that's, that's I'm not very articulate, so sorry. <laughs> I think you've done a beautiful job, Janice, and I'm going to ask you just to drill down on what you want to be remembered for, but I have to say that when I met you um, through your cousins, yes, uh -huh. and the good ladies that I worked with um, on the Women's Success Advisory Board, yes, the very first time I met you, you were passionate and you wanted to make a difference. And you looked at this group and started, you know, talking and exchanging ideas in such a way that very quickly we made you the chair of the scholarship committee. Yeah. And then we formed a whole new group of, of women that were dedicated to finding scholarships for women that didn't have mm -hmm. resources. Yeah. And you just absolutely grew that from nothing into a, a million dollars. I mean, it was just amazing to see what you could do and change in a society. So from my perspective, I'll always remember you for yeah. that. Yeah. And I think that you will have impacted lives for generations and given back in a way that you didn't have to, but mm -hmm. that you really set the tone for um, all of us to live up to the passion and the uh, the desire to help. You just yeah. like got your 
sleeves rolled up and <laughs> got in and did the work. It was amazing. So that's what I will remember you for. What Thanks, you Anne. You'll be remembered well, for. Thank you, you know, for th that's beautiful the way that you worded that and thank you for for bringing that up and and I did I do feel very passionate about women receiving their education and giving them an opportunity to do so and oftentimes it's the financial means that they lack. And so if we can rally those that do have the financial means to help those that don't, then those women and their families and their communities are going to be blessed because education is such an important thing in a woman's life. Um, but one of the things that I truly believe in is that out of small efforts, great things come to pass. And out of small things, great accomplishments can be made. And so it always starts in a small way and then it snowballs. And it's the same thing as if you were to throw a pebble into some water and you see the ripple effect. And I think that that's where, that's kind of how I get my, this passion is that, that we can do small little things and we can make a phone call or we can um, invite someone to do something or we can just out of these small little things great things can come to pass and that's what's happening right now with our community suicide awareness and prevention collaboration team we've changed it to hope for orem team now and we're the mayor's involved the the alpine school district the principals the counselors doTERRA businesses um, hospitals, the fire department, the police department, and it just takes a phone call and an invitation. And it takes these small little steps that then come together in a collaboration, a collabor in a united way to make something great. And so it's just amazing to me, out of small and simple things, great things can come to pass. And um, whatever we're involved in, you just start with something and then involve others and, and you can accomplish great things. We can always accomplish things, greater things, when we're working together with other people than we can by ourselves. And what was accomplished with raising that scholarship money at UVU, for UVU, women at UVU, it took a team. And you were on that team, man, and others were on that team. And we all work together to accomplish something great. And so I really, truly believe in working with other people, uh, collaborating with other people, um, and that out of just small and simple efforts, great things can come to pass. Yeah. I love that. I, I think but I inspired. do want to be remembered for being generous. That's what <laughs> I want to be remembered. If I could, I want to be remembered for being generous and kind. And, and loving people, and that, that pe they, people know I love them. I want to be known as a person that loves others, that loves people, that's generous, and that's kind. And um, yesterday, we were coming, leaving the, the Energy Solutions Building. Is that what it's still called? I think so. We watched the Jazz. Energy Solutions Center, yeah. We watched the Jazz. We were leaving, and there was a man sitting there, you know, with his sign, and I said, Corey, give me a dollar. I want to give it to him. He's like, you know you're not supposed to give it to them, right? Because they're just going to use it for drugs and alcohol. I said, give me a dollar. I really want to give this man a dollar. I don't care what he spends it on. He's out there with his sign in the cold. He needs to know someone cares for him, someone loves him, that he's not invisible. So... <laughs> <laughs> so that is, that's what I want to be known for, generous. I want to be a generous, kind person. And that's what I want to be known for, yeah. Do you have any other advice for the women of Utah? I would say um, for the women of Utah, expand your horizons. <laughs> Expand your horizons and if you've lived in Utah all your life and you've never traveled outside of Utah or outside of the country I would look for for ways opportunities to To be educated as to what is outside of Utah whether it's on the internet You know looking up different countries learning about different countries um, 
maybe becoming a pen pal with somebody that lives in a different country. I would say just um, expand your horizons because Utah is awesome and it's the most beautiful state. It's the most, home is, home is here in Utah for me right now. And, but I would say expand your horizons and see what you can learn from people outside of the state of Utah, from people and places outside of the state of Utah. I guess that's what I would say. What would you still like to accomplish in your life? Well, my husband and I were planning on serving missions together. So I look forward to accomplishing that with my husband and following the example of our parents. In retirement, they went and served missions together and then they worked in the temple and they served their family, their grandchildren, um, their community. Uh, I want to be just active and I want to follow the example of the prophet skiing at age 92, 93. I want, my goal is to stay in good health so that I can be physically active um, for as long as I can until I die. And I want to love and serve people um, and recognize opportunities that come my way and be proactive in, in, in serving others is what um, I hope to do, continue to do now and throughout the rest of my life. It's what I want to do. We've talked about a lot of things, Janice. I yeah. know you're full of wisdom and you've given us some great insights. Is there anything else that we should talk about before we conclude our interview? Let's talk about how wonderful you are <laughs> and how much I admire you and how much I look up to you, Anne, and how you are an amazing woman. I admire the fact that you have your doctorate degree. My goodness, that is such an accomplishment. And you have blessed so many people's lives through this. And one of the things that I also admire about you is you always look for ways to, to um to build women up and to also expose women <laughs> in you know and their strengths and and what they're doing and it helps helps us women feel more confident and and secure in ourselves and and to be able to reflect on on our lives and realize that wow you know we are a force we women mm -hmm. here in the world and we can accomplish a lot of good in our homes, in the community, in church, internationally, wherever we are, in the workplace, we, we can do a lot as women. And so you've taught me that, and you have exemplified that. And um, you're a dear friend that I love to go horseback riding with too. <laughs> so I just cannot say enough about you, Anne, and I would love to interview you <laughs> is what I would love to do because you are a woman I look up to and admire Thank and you. you're one of my mentors now oh. that I'm now that I'm at age 53 and you know I my mother and my grandmothers were mentors when I was younger now I look to women like you and like Paige Holland and like other women um, that we associate with that are my exemplars and my my examples, my, my mentors. So thank you for being such a dear mentor for me. Oh, there's so many experiences that I've had in my life that I wish I could have yes. you taste them and the feel them and, and yes. see them and experience them, you know, because I mean, living overseas in all those different countries, I mean, that's a story in and of itself, you know. Each one. Bolivia. Hong Kong, Japan, China, Australia, you know, and of course here in the United States and, of America. And wherever else you and Corey will go too, yeah. because I mean, yeah. think of it, for the next 30, 40, 50 yeah, years, that's true. you may be all over the world yeah, giving that's back. True. And I've also found living overseas is that wherever your husband and your family are, that's where home is. Aww. And it feels like home. See, that is really profound. We should get that because <laughs> it's true. So. I always looked at living overseas as an opportunity, as a blessing, as a privilege.